The issues that I would like to cover will already be discussed by this time. And now I would like to invite uh, my friend Daniel Porras to our stage. I can't uh, buy, uh, but congratulate him on Thanksgiving Day. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for inviting me. My name is Daniel Porras. I am the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Communications at Secure World Foundation. We're an organization based in the United States that focuses on sustainable space activities and making sure that we'll be able to continue using uh, Earth's most precious orbits for the, uh, many generations to come. Um, I'm also a security fellow at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. So today what I'm going to talk about is perhaps a little bit darker than uh, what my previous colleagues have discussed. Uh, and that is in particular the prevention of an arms race in outer space. So today at the United Nations, we discuss an agenda item on the prevention of an arms race in outer space. This item is intended to ensure both traditional and strategic stability in the space environment. However, the paradigm of PAROS, or the prevention of an arms race in outer space, might be slightly inadequate as we cannot separate arms racing in outer space from an arms race on Earth. Modern militaries rely on outer space, especially for nuclear weapon systems. In this case, if there is an arms race on Earth, space will play a key role in it. Now, are we in the middle of an arms race in outer space? There are some indicators that, uh, that we are. In 2020, my colleagues and I at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research drafted a report that identified three indicators of an arms race involving, uh, involving space systems. These were rivalries, corresponding technologies, and acceleration and development. Unfortunately, we are all too aware that current geopolitical relations are currently not in a good place. Mistrust and antagonism exist between all the major space, space powers but most notably between China, India, Russia, and the United States. Other NATO allies are now also becoming entangled in space rivalries. Next, we are seeing the development of counter space capabilities which can target space objects for disruption, degradation, or destruction. These capabilities can be used to interfere with an opponent's ability to communicate with troops in the field, to blind reconnaissance operations, or even take down key components of a nuclear delivery system. My organization, the Secure World Foundation, publishes an annual report each year detailing by country what technologies are being developed, how they have been tested, and what they might be able to do. The executive summary of this report is available in Russian as well, as Dmitry well knows. Finally, we are seeing proxy indicators of an acceleration in the development of counter space capabilities. More and more countries are establishing dedicated military space units and countries are increasingly testing weapons capable of interfering with space systems. This strongly suggests that states are preparing themselves for a conflict that involves attacking space systems for whatever reason. Given these indicators, we see an arms race unfolding and space will simply be a key part of it. However, we are very concerned that conflict will spread into space in large part because we do not understand the consequences. Even the mere testing of anti-satellite technologies as has been done by China, India, Russia, and the United States, has generated considerable amounts of debris that are extremely difficult to predict or model. No one has done so successfully at this time. Moreover, other activities like jamming or close proximity operations create situations which could easily lead to miscalculation or misinterpretation, which in turn generates escalation between strategic rivals. To avoid such scenarios, we ought to seek guardrails or norms, whether political or legal in nature, that will ensure that conflict in space will be minimal and not impact other critical assets. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to happy to chat. Uh, yes, thank you, dear colleagues. I would like to add uh, that, uh, as far as I understand, uh, Daniel will leave us after his speech. So, if you have any questions. Uh, uh, you can ask them now, and I would like to make use of the right of moderator, and I would like to ask Blitz question, which I will address to other speakers. Daniel, if we consider just one problem, which problem do you think the most important, the most urgent at the connection of space security, geospatial technologies, whatever we interpret them, which will be the most important problem, the most urgent problem? Could you please share your, your opinion? 
Sorry. Uh, ah, there we go. I just got the the uh, the interpretation. Can you please repeat? Oh, okay, I'll do it in English now. Uh, so uh, I'll be having like a short questions to every speaker in the end of our session. Yes, but I'll start with you as you are probably leaving. So uh, the question is, what is one single biggest problem, biggest challenge in the field of space, security, and well, guess yeah, special technologies that need to be addressed immediately? Uh, uh, as my partner always tells me, a good relationship is all about communication. And unfortunately, at the moment, we have terrible communication between some of the major space rivals. Um, we have allowed our, our relationship to be filled with a lot of mistrust. Um, this can be seen very, very clearly in the way that uh, the U.S. and China react to each other's space activities. Um, sometimes they, uh, you know, both countries de are developing certain types of technologies that are both dual use and multi use, um, like uh, debris removal technology, so that we can take trash out of orbit. Unfortunately, if you can take trash, you can also take functional satellites as well. Uh, and so it doesn't matter that, you know, China puts out a statement that says, hey, we're going to launch something to remove trash because they don't share very much information at all. The rest of the world seems to, well, not the rest of the world, the Western world um, seems to assume the worst uh, at all times. Uh, the same goes for the United States. Sometimes they'll be developing certain types of technology that they want to use as tools um, but they'll be interpreted in uh, in Russian or Chinese corners as being uh, tools for aggressive activities and operations. And so because we're not speaking to one another and we're not sharing very much information, everybody just uh, makes bad assumptions. And so I think if, if we can't start talking to one another, we're never going to solve this problem. Uh, many thanks. Uh, we also have a question from uh, Lim Mohammed in the chat box, and it goes as follows. Uh, how do you think can international cooperation using the special technologies be improved to prevent the unfolding of the arms race you foresee, you've mentioned a lot? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so perhaps one of the things that we, we also really need right now is just to know what's happening in outer space. Um, as our good colleague, Dr. Marie Baja, is very fond of telling everyone, we don't actually know what's happening in space. We can just make very good estimated guesses as to where objects are, where they're moving, and where they're going to be. Uh, perhaps getting better technology that can sense what is in especially low Earth orbit. Um, where are objects? Where are they going? Where are they moving to? Uh, and to be able to share as much of this technology as possible, that could actually help us to, to improve relations. Um, in particular, we have all of these things called uh, close proximity operations, where one country's satellite will get very, very close to another person's satellite. We're not always sure what they're doing. Uh, most likely they're uh, listening in on, uh, on radio transmissions. Um, but it also presents a physical threat and it, it could present a potential for, for physical harm. So if we had better sensors so that we can see where, where everyone is going, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of countries would be reluctant to get too close, um, especially to, to those distances that, that present a threat of, of potential harm. So yeah, just being able to see things better will enable us to be able to monitor and potentially verify any obligations that we develop through international, uh, international rulemaking. Um, but we have to be able to share that data and that's where the international cooperation part comes in. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. If there are no more questions, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, dear colleagues, if uh, you do not know, uh, you can raise uh, your hand, a virtual hand. There is a button. Raise your hand in the web chat. There is a capability. And as nobody is doing this, I think we can move on to the next report. And uh, we have a question from Alexandra Grigorenko. The ability to receive geodata without asking about it, because technology today allows it. So, um, yes, there, well, it, not necessarily just communications. Uh, we, we are having problems right now with um, frequency management anyway, uh, in terms of being able to um, 
send all of our electronic signals uh, through satellites without you know interfering with other people's signals. But now, of course, we are developing the capability to interfere intentionally. Uh, jamming and um, spoofing are are some very difficult uh, new strategies to deal with because it's very simple. The technology is available to almost any country. We've seen plenty of situations where um, even emerging countries have been able to jam satellites simply by taking a giant dish with a sufficiently powerful um, source. You change the channel to match the, the channel of the satellite that you want to hit, and you just drown out the, the signal. Um, and, and this is becoming a big problem. We, we know also that uh, NATO countries and Russia have engaged in uh, jamming each other uh, during various military exercises. That's really nerve wracking because what if somebody doesn't think that's an exercise or thinks like, oh, this is the, the precursor to uh, a serious attack and a, a situation can, can escalate very quickly there. Um, the, the trick now is going to be as the technology gets more and more available, who's doing it? It's not always necessarily going to be countries. It might not be um, a very sophisticated, very uh, advanced system that's being used. Um, other non-state actors can now get access to this type of technology. Will they use it? And if they're using it, who's going to tell them to go turn it off? Um, this is going to start creating a lot of challenges as, as we become more and more dependent on, on space systems. Um, I'm sure we're going to see a lot of that once the, the big mega constellations start going up. But at least for the moment, the only... Uh, the only tool that we have to use is um, negotiation, diplomacy, call each other up and say, hi, something in your country is jamming something that I'm using. Can you please turn it off? And, and if we can't talk to one another, I don't know what, what we're going to do. Daniel, thank you very much. Well, actually, I don't see any more questions, and unfortunately, that was a wonderful discussion, and I'm sorry that you have to leave. So, uh, so we move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, Daniel, you want to say something else? No, that's it. Just thank you very much for having me. Uh,